Alright, for this one, on photosynthesis, I'm using the PowerPoint from the book because they have a really, um, they have a lot of really great visuals, and I've just added into it some of the uh, questions, but pretty much all of the questions that were asked in this learning target are, uh, for photosynthesis, are covered in the presentation. Uh, I just add one extra at the front and at the end. So... Uh, photosynthesis is a process that converts solar energy into chemical energy, which we know. Uh, plants and other autotrophs are the producers of the biosphere. So basically what we're looking at here is that pretty much everything uh, has to come from plants and other autotrophs, but really mostly plants. Um, they produce so much of the usable energy for all sorts of other organisms. So our first question that we're going to cover is number five. Can you describe the evolutionary pathway of photosynthetic prokaryotes in, uh, to eukaryotic photosynthesis? Well, so we know that prokaryotes came evolutionarily before eukaryo eukaryotic cells, but they actually think, scientists think that photosynthesis originated not long after life originated on Earth. So we had a big transition from the conditions that uh, early life on Earth was like to what it is like now. And a big part of that was because of photosynthesis that was done in prokaryotic cells. Now what we know about prokaryotic cells is that they don't have membrane-bound organelles the way eukaryotic cells do. Uh, remember, eukaryotic cells are plant or animal cells, so those are just your generic models that we did in our notebooks. So what that meant is that photosynthesis needed to occur in a different location in the cell. So for prokaryotic cells, what they actually think happened was that photosynthesis was done in the plasma membrane. So there were a bunch of little folds in the membrane that sort of resemble the phylicoid stacks, or they look kind of similar actually, and that's where photosynthesis was done. Um, over a long period of time after eukaryotic cells developed, that was when it started to be done in the chloroplast. All right, so plants are photoautotrophs, and it's important to understand, here we are again, photo is going to mean light, auto, self, troph is going to be um, that food source. So they're taking the energy from the sunlight, and through, um, internally, they're able to turn that into useful molecules that are going to give our bodies or their uh, cells um, energy. So photosynthesis is going to occur in a bunch of different things. Uh, plants, algae, other protists, and as I mentioned before, some prokaryotes, except it will look a little different due to their lack of, um, of membrane-bound organelles. Okay, we talked about heterotrophs a little bit in the last one, but they obtain organic material from other organisms. We consume what the autotrophs make. We are an example of, an, of a heterotroph. Okay, so where does photosynthesis occur? It's actually going to occur mostly in the leaves of plants. And that makes sense. We've talked a lot about surface area. And the reason that leaves have such a wide um, shape to them is that they need to have a lot of surface area in order for gas exchange and for the absorption of sunlight. So all photosynthesis is going to be done in the leaves of the plants. So if we look over here, uh, at the very bottom of our leaf, so what this is pointing to would be this underside here, this is called the stomata. And the stomata actually have the ability to open and close and that's where carbon dioxide is uh, entering into our cells, or into their cells, and oxygen is released. And then you can see that the internal part of the uh, leaf is called the mesophyll, mesophyll. Okay, so our chloroplasts are those green organelles, green looking organelles in the cell. They contain thylakoids, which would be each of these individual pancake looking structures and uh, a stack of them, so the thylakoid stack is called the granum. Uh, the space in between is the stroma, and it is important to know this because 
uh, photosynthesis is going to occur in actually two different parts of the chloroplast. It will occur in the thylakoid and then it will also occur in the stroma. So it is important to know um, where those things are, what they look like, and what is actually happening as far as photosynthesis in each of those places. Okay, so photosynthesis, uh, it's really important to be able to have this, or to have this equation memorized. Six carbon dioxide molecules, 12 H2O plus light energy, will convert into C6H12O6, 6O2, and 6H2O. Now, let's look at actually, okay, where are all of those things happening? So for those that did not learn this in middle school, uh, whatever's on the left side of our arrow is going to be considered our reactants, and then everything over here on the right side is the products, which is the result of whatever reaction occurs over here. Think of it like a, a math problem, like two plus two equals four. Those twos are still in our problem, they're just combined now. So we have the same thing happening here. We can combine these and basically we're just reordering everything here in a different way. But how those things actually get reordered is really important because it happens in different parts of uh, the photosynthetic process. So our carbon dioxide molecules, we can track, okay, here's where our carbons go and here is where part of our oxygens go into both of these. Now our water is actually going to be split so we can see that the oxygen is going to come over here and that's actually, so it's important to note, the oxygen that's released out into the atmosphere after photosynthesis, know that that is coming from water. It is not coming from the carbon dioxide molecule, it's actually coming from H2O. So this is where our oxygen comes from and then the hydrogens are going to be split into our two other products. Okay, so photosynthet uh, photosynthesis is a redox uh, reaction, and what that is going to mean is um, a redox reaction has both reduction and oxidation. So what are those things? Uh, one way that I've heard to remember it is Leo says ger, uh, L-E-O says G-E-R, because if you lose an electron, you are being lose electrons, you are being oxidized. If you gain electrons, you are being reduced. So in this situation, water is going to lose electrons and become oxidized, and carbon dioxide is going to gain electrons and become reduced. So that's what a redox reaction is. Sorry, it's so loud. Okay, photosynthesis consists of two main processes. You are going to hear these called many different things. What we are officially calling them now for our class is the light reactions and then the Calvin cycle. Uh, you'll hear it also as light dependent and then light independent, light dependent or dark, light reaction or dark, um, but just know that they're basically all just different names for the same thing that's going on. Our light reactions occur in the grana. Uh, and in the light reactions, the main thing that's happening is that we're going to split water. So we saw that in the first one. So for splitting water, remember those oxygen uh, molecules, I'm sorry, the water, um, the oxygen that's in the water molecules becomes uh, O2. So that's where that oxygen is being released. So that happens in the very beginning of photosynthesis. This is where we produce ATP. ATP is adenosine triphosphate, which is our... Uh, it's like uh, energy basically. The way I usually relate it is that ATP is the um, currency, energy currency of the cells and form NADPH. NADPH is going to be super important for um, photosynthesis. Okay, so once again, light reactions are in the grana and the Calvin cycle is in the stroma, which is an open space in the in the Calvin cycle, this is where uh, we form sugar from carbon dioxide, that's our C6H12O6. We use ATP for energy and NADPH for our reducing power, so that's where we're gaining our electrons. 
So here's a really good image of what photosynthesis looks like. So we have light that enters into our thylakoid stacks here, water enters, and then at the very beginning, this is where we're releasing oxygen. So we know that that is from uh, this water molecule. Now obviously if we look at this, there's only one oxygen here and there's two here. So we're going to have to take in several molecules of water, it's not just going to be a single one. So this is going to happen in the light reaction. Now, in the light reaction, we're going to send ATP and we're going to send NADPH over to the Calvin cycle. Notice that it is continuously happening. So, in the Calvin cycle, this is where we are going to utilize our carbon dioxide. This is where we are going to release our sugar. And then we are going to utilize this ATP and NADPH and then we're sending it back over, once we've used it, as ADP. We also send over that extra phosphate. So ATP is adenosine triphosphate, so there's going to be three phosphate molecules attached to it. Whereas ADP is adenosine diphosphate, so there's just going to be one, um, I'm sorry, two phosphate molecules here and then one on its own. And we also send over this NADP plus. Notice that these are just going to be cycled back and forth, back and forth. Okay, light reactions convert solar energy to the chemical energy of ATP and NADPH. Now real quick, I wanted to go back to this. Um, the reason we call this the light reactions, and then sometimes this is called the dark reactions, uh, now it's known as the Calvin cycle, but it's because the light reactions obviously require a source of light in order for them to occur. The Calvin cycle can actually continue to occur uh, even after uh, the presence of light is gone, as long as there's enough stored up of ATP and NADPH to send over, uh, the Calvin cycle will actually be able to continue on. Okay. Um, this part here is um, not really for any of the questions that were asked for this week, but it's important to know them. Uh, you might be asked one or two of these questions on your test. So light is a form of electromagnetic energy which travels in waves. What is a wavelength? Uh, a wavelength is the distance between the crests of the waves and it determines the type of electromagnetic energy. This will become a little bit more clear when we have some more pictures here. So our electromagnetic spectrum is the entire range of electromagnetic energy or radiation. So you can see we have our gamma rays over here, our radio waves here, and we have a really small part of our spectrum is visible light. So we've kind of zoomed in here and we see we have all sorts of different colors. These are the colors that we see and we observe. Now, the reason they look so different is because of their wavelengths. So purple, blues, and greens are going to have uh, a shorter wavelength, whereas our reds, oranges, and yellows are going to start having longer wavelengths. I pretty much already covered this. It includes the wavelengths that drive photosynthesis. So yeah, we've got that. Okay, so now, why is all of that important? And that's because of our pigments. We'll know that um, photosynthesis, we associate obviously with that green color, and we'll talk about why. Um, pigments are substances that absorb the light from this spectrum here, our visible light spectrum. Okay, so if we reflect light, um, reflect light, which includes the colors we see. So. Basically what's happening here is the pigments that are in our chloroplasts, we'll talk about what those are called in just a few minutes here, but what's happening is light, visible light, is coming into our chloroplast. Now all of this, this red, yellow, blue, and orange, and purple, is absorbed. So our pigments absorb all of these colors. The only color actually that's reflected is green. And that's why we see it. And that's actually how it works with all of the colors that we see is because all the other um, wavelengths from the spectrum, that from our visible light spectrum, have been absorbed. Everything reflected is what we see. So that's why um, we associate photosynthesis with that green color. Oh, okay, spectrophotometer is pretty cool. It's a machine that sends light through pigments and measures the fraction of light transmitted in, um, at each wavelength. So here's an absorption spectrum, uh, and it's a graph uh, plotting light absorption versus wavelength. 
So as you can see here, we have our green light and our chlorophyll solution. Now what's happening is here, that green light is being reflected through our chlorophyll solution. However, here we know that chlorophyll absorbs blue light. We could have done this with any color. We could have done it with red. We could have done it with purple. But basically, um, blue light comes through, chlorophyll absorbs it, and then what that means over here is that there's going to be a very low uh, transmittance reading because the chlorophyll absorbs that blue light. Here, it does not. It allows the um, green to go through, so that's why we have high transmittance. Uh, okay, so the absorption spectra of chloroplast pigments provides clues to the relative effectiveness of different wavelengths for driving photosynthesis. So we can actually test and see what one is most effective. And here we go. The absorption spectra of three types of pigments in chloroplast. So um, we're looking at really at chlorophyll A and B are going to be super important. So our experiment is three different experiments help to reveal which wavelengths of light are photosynthetically important. The results are shown below. So on our y-axis here, we have the absorption of light by chloroplast pigments, and then we have the wavelength of light. So the three curves show the wavelengths of light best absorbed by three types of chloroplast pigments. So once again, these are the names of our pigments that are going to be utilized. Okay, so here's our action spectrum of a pigment. And it profiles the relative effectiveness of different wavelengths of radiation in driving photosynthesis. Um, we don't need to look at this one too much. Same with this. Okay, here's what we need to know. Chlorophyll A and B. Chlorophyll A is going to be our main photosynthetic pigment. If we go back here, we can see the color of chlorophyll A and uh, B. And look, they're greenish, kind of bluish here, but um, that is why we see uh, that color. Chlorophyll B is going to be our accessory pigment. So once again, it's important to know chlorophyll A and B are our main pigments in photosynthesis. Other pigments absorb different wavelengths of light and then pass that energy on to chlorophyll A. Okay, so here's what's actually happening. Uh, chlorophyll is what's actually in charge of doing the light absorption. So here we have our photon represented here by our squiggly line and we have our chlorophyll down here. So. This is the E minus is going to represent uh, an electron. We know that because electrons have that negative charge. So what happens is our electrons that started at a ground state are excited by photons. So that's why it's represented like this. It's excited. When that photon excites our electrons, when it's coming back down, it's going to release uh, heat and fluorescence. And it's going to come back down to our ground state. So it's just kind of like a cycle here of our electrons becoming excited, passing along that energy, and then uh, coming back down. Um, and it's important to know that our electrons that have been excited are very unstable. So they're not going to be excited for an extended period of time. It happens very quickly. Uh, so as I just said here, we're giving off some of that uh, fluorescence. Uh, if an isolated solution of chlorophyll is illuminated, here is that fluorescence that we're discussing, uh, and it's giving off um, that light, fluorescence, and, uh, and heat, which is energy. Okay, photosystem, a reaction center associated with light harvesting complexes. Okay, photosystems. This is going to be part of the um, beginning of photosynthesis in our light uh, reaction. A photosystem is composed of a reaction center surrounded by a number of light harvesting complexes. So all of this light harvesting complexes, notice where we are, we are in the stroma and this is in our um, thylakoid space. So this would be our thylakoid membrane. This is where our um, photosystems take place, thylakoid membrane. And then here we just talked about this. You can see all of this is that photon, that light absorption passing along that energy and exciting that electron. 
Uh, the light harvesting complexes consist of pigment molecules bound to particular proteins. Funnel the energy of photons of light to the reaction center. When a reaction center chlorophyll molecule absorbs energy, one of its electrons bumps, um, gets bumped up to a primary electron acceptor. There we go. Uh, and the primary electron acceptor. Okay, the thylakoid membrane is populated by two types of photosystem, photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. I'll show you guys a picture of that in just a second here. And this is considered our non-cyclic electron flow. It's the primary pathway of energy transformation in light reactions. And the reason it's considered non-cyclic is, once again, you'll see it in the picture uh, coming up here, is those energies are passed along and then not cycled through. That energy is given away. Super important to know. In these photosystems, this is where NADPH, ATP, and oxygen are produced. Okay. So this is a representation of photosystem 1 and photosystem 2. Uh, it's really annoying. Let me see. Oh, no, we have to go through this first. Photosystem 2 actually is before photosystem 1. So first thing that happens, light is going to enter in the form of a photon and excite electrons. Where did number 2 go? Oh, here it is. <laughs> Uh, those electrons are going to be excited and become um, and go to the primary acceptor. The third thing that's going to happen is this is where our, walks, uh, our uh, water molecule comes in, and you'll see that it's donating those electrons. You can see them right in here. That's the electrons that are actually getting excited. And uh, the water molecule actually splits, and this is why we have our two hydrogens. And this is where we get the oxygen that's released in photosynthesis is right after photosystem, or right during photosystem two. Okay, next thing. We have our electron transport chain, and this is where those electrons are basically getting passed along um, through our cytochrome complex all the way over to photosystem one. Notice that we're getting uh, ATP out of this process. All right, six and seven here, we have light once again entering into photosystem one, exciting our electrons up to our primary acceptor. So really, like what's happening in this light reaction is we're getting energy to come in and excite electrons, and then we're passing that energy along. And then once again, here we go, we're going through the ETC, the electron transport chain, passing along those um, electrons to NADP+. Oops. Now through that, NADP plus, we're going to gain these hydrogens here to create NADPH. NADPH is going to be what's passed along uh, into the next um, part of photosynthesis. So what we can see, we're getting oxygen, we get ATP through the electron transport chain in the cytochrome complex between photosystem 2 and 1. We get the electron transport chain again, we're passing along NADP plus to become NADPH. So. NADPH, ATP, oxygen. That's what's happening in our light reactions. Um, this is just a, an example of a mechanical analogy for the light reactions. You can see that the photon puts that energy in to, um, to excite the electron in photosystem two to start. Here we are making that ATP through those um, electrons. And then once again, we're adding in more energy here, but we're already at a higher state, so that's why the electron is being excited even further this time and then becoming that NADPH in photosystem one. Okay, under certain uh, conditions, photoexcited electrons can take an alternative path, so this is our cyclic electron flow. Okay, uh, and I think your question was, if I go back a bit, let me see here. Hmm. I can't find what number it was. I had it in here, I thought. Maybe I put it in the wrong place. But one of your questions is, like, is can you explain the non-cyclic? Actually, I think I put it at the end. It's okay, you guys know what I'm talking about. 
Uh, one of your questions is uh, what is happening in the non-cyclic part of, um, I think it says in the light dependent reactions. I'm sorry, yeah, the light reactions. So that's what we just talked about. So this is an alternative. This is our cyclic electron flow. Uh, when this happens, we're actually not using photosystem two. We're only gonna be using photosystem one and no oxygen is going to be produced. So only ATP is being produced through this. So we get the electrons excited going to the um, primary acceptor through the cytochrome complex, which is releasing that ATP molecule. Okay, so question number seven is, can you compare and contrast chemiosmosis in cellular respiration with chemiosmosis in the light reactions of photosynthesis? You're going to see a ton of um, similarities in photosynthesis and cellular respiration. Some things are very similar, some things you'll have opposites. Uh, so let's look at chemiosmosis. Uh, okay, chloroplast and mitochondria, so this chloroplast is going to be used for photosynthesis, mitochondria for cellular respiration. Uh, both of them generate ATP by the same basic mechanism, chemiosmosis. They're gonna use different forms of energy to accomplish this. So if we look here, Here's our chloroplast and our mitochondria, which is going to be used in um, uh, cellular respiration. So here's our electron transport chain. We're bringing those hydro molecule, hydrogen molecules into um, the matrix of the uh, thylakoid space. And through ATP synthase, we're taking our ADP molecule, our phosphate, and through ATP synthase, we create ATP molecules. So in both of our organelles, redox reactions of electron transport chains generate a hydrogen plus gradient across the membrane. So what does that mean? What's happening in the electron transport chain is we're creating hydrogen gradients. So in both of these, in both the chloroplast and the mitochondria, we have our electron transport chain pushing out these hydrogen molecules. That's creating a gradient, okay? So we'd have a positive charge out here and more of a negative charge inside. And then they push them back in and through ATP synthase, we get ATP molecules. So this proton motive force makes ATP. Once again, this is going to happen in cellular respiration and in the light reactions of photosynthesis. It's called chemiosmosis and it's this process of pushing hydrogen molecules out to create a gradient, pushing them back in to have ATP synthase make ATP molecules. Okay, so now let's look at 6A. Can you explain how both the mitochondria and the chloroplast use the electron transport chains for their cellular reactions? And can you describe how light energy is converted to ATP and NADPH in non-cyclic photophosphorylation? Uh, here's that question I was looking for. So this was also kind of already answered but this will give you more detail. Okay, all right, this looks crazy, I know. However, it's actually really not all that, um, all that complicated when you really look at this. So the light reactions in chemiosmosis, the organization of the thylakoid membrane. So once again, what we're focusing on right now is the light reactions. We are not even at the Calvin cycle yet. We are looking at just what is colored here. So. Here we go again. The nice thing is we've already kind of done some of this. We did this photosystem two and one, and we talked about the cytochrome complex. So water enters into photosystem two, light in photon form enters into photosystem two. Energy, um, photon energy excites electrons to the acceptor. Water split and releases oxygen. See that's only half because there's only one oxygen here. So we need several water molecules to come in. So, photosystem two, excites electrons, splits water, releases O2, and then those excited electrons pass on that energy through the cytochrome complex. Now look here, this is where we have our, um, oh my gosh, our, uh, our hydrogen gradient. So through that gradient, here we go, we're bringing those hydrogen molecules back in. And I'm gonna kind of skip over to this section now. So now we take those hydrogen molecules, Whoop, all the way over down here, through ATP synthase, taking ADP, that phosphate, through that push of those hydrogen molecules, we're creating ATP. The nice thing is that you don't really need to know any more in depth than what you see here. 
So you don't need to understand, honestly, even how this is happening. You just need to understand that it's happening. That ATP synthase through this hydrogen gradient is taking ADP molecules and turning it into ATP molecules, which is usable energy. Okay, back up here to our cytochrome complex. You can see that those excited energy or excited electrons are being passed along their uh, electron transport chain here. And then we're into photosystem. One again, where we get more light, more excited electrons. And now here we have the um, transition from NADP plus to NADP, NADPH. Now those two things, NADPH and ATP, need to go onto the Calvin cycle. So now we can see that those are going to be cycled through. Where is this ADP and NADP plus coming from in the first place? Well, it's coming from the Calvin cycle. So as you can see, it looks crazy, but it's not that bad. As long as you know the major things in each photosystem and the electron transport chain, which is just pushing along these electrons. So now the Calvin cycle uses ATP and NADPH, NADPH, ATP, uh, to convert carbon dioxide to sugar molecules. The Calvin cycle is going to be similar to the citric acid cycle and occurs in the stroma, which is the outside space in the chloroplast. The Calvin cycle has three main phases. You do need to know these three phases, but luckily when I show you the picture of it, you aren't going to need to know the specific molecules. So this is carbon fixation, that's the first part, reduction, and then regeneration of the carbon dioxide acceptor. Okay, once again, it looks crazy, but it's really not that bad. All of these things you really do not need to know, okay? Uh, what's important is understanding the different phases. So the first phase is carbon fixation. Now what we do have to know is that we have carbon dioxide entering now into the Calvin cycle. So we don't even use, normally in your, uh, like your general photosynthesis equation, you see all these and as your product, or reactants and then these as your products. Uh, know that that is, that they're all coming in at different times. So Calvin cycle is where we have carbon dioxide entering and we get carbon fixation. Note that we have six ATP molecules coming in to push this along because it needs energy in order to conduct this reaction. And because of it, we release six ADP molecules. We also have to push six NADPH molecules as our um, hydrogen carriers here. And six NADPH plus is released, I'm sorry, as our electron carriers. And this is where reduction happens. You can see down here at the bottom of the Calvin cycle is where we're releasing our sugar molecules. And then we move into phase three, which is regeneration of the carbon dioxide acceptor, which is known as Rubesco. All right, I'm sorry, RUBP. Um, okay, finally here on this slide, we have three ATP molecules entering in and ADP coming out. So once again, it's not important to know all of these things. It's just important to know the three different phases and that we get uh, sugar as an output in between reduction and the regeneration of the carbon dioxide acceptor. So now alternative mechanisms of carbon fixation have evolved in hot, arid climates. Uh, this is really fascinating because on hot, dry days, plants can close their stomata, which are those openings at the bottom of the leaves, which actually will help conserve water. However, what it does is it obviously causes um, a limited access to carbon dioxide because they're while they're conserving water, they're also reducing their uh, gas flow. So this actually causes oxygen to build up. So what happens in photorespiration is that oxygen substitutes for carbon dioxide in the active site of the enzyme rubisco. The photosynthetic rate is reduced though. All right, so when C4 plants, um, C4 plants minimize the cost of photorespiration by incorporating carbon dioxide into four carbon compounds in the mesophyll cells. These four carbon compounds are expected to bundle sheath cells, are exported to bundle sheath cells, where they release carbon dioxide used in the Calvin cycle. This isn't really for any questions, but just, just good to know. Uh, so here's what a C4 leaf anatomy and C4 pathway looks like. So you can see it's just an alternative here. Okay, now, this one you probably do need to know. This is CAM plant. 
and um, they open their somata at night, inhibiting carbon dioxide into organic acids. During the day, their stomata close, and the carbon dioxide is released from their organic acids to use in the Calvin cycle. So this pathway is similar to the C4 pathway, and um, is temporal separation of steps. So temporal, we talked about, is just that timing. So really an, um, an amazing thing that it's able to do this uh, uh, process and differentiate between night and day. Okay, so now 914. Can you describe the light dependent reactions of photosynthesis, including reactants and products? And can you outline the light dependent and light independent photosynthetic processes? So here is perfect. Here is what we um, had talked about. We went through all of these steps um, individually, but I wanted to show you this image all together because it it looks really nice and we have our main points of each. So here we go. Here's our light reaction, this whole left-hand side. We start with photosystem 2 to ETC to photosystem 1. In light reactions, they're carried out by molecules in the thylakoid membranes. They convert light energy to the chemical energy of ATP and NADPH, which we're giving to the Calvin cycle. This is where we split water and release oxygen into the atmosphere. Now onto the Calvin cycle. This is where it takes place in the stroma. We have to use ATP and NADPH to convert carbon dioxide into, um, into sugar molecules. Uh, we return the ADP and uh, NADP plus back to the light reactions. Organic compounds produced by photosynthesis help provide the energy and building material for ecosystems. Now our last question is number 10. Can you compare and contrast chemosynthesis from photosynthesis? So we didn't talk about this too much, but uh, photosynthesis and chemosynthesis are going to be very similar processes. However, chemosynthesis is going to use heat and sulfur compounds instead of sunlight uh, for the energy to do, uh, to create nutrients. Um, a lot of this is going, like a lot of chemosynthesis is going to happen uh, like really deep down in the bottom of the ocean where there would be no access to light energy. They still are able to produce their own nutrients. All right.